So good morning everybody, Neil Foley from the Business Growth Club here today. Um, delighted to have somebody I don't actually know very well, but we've been talking for a little while, Tom Hercheski. Is that That's a it. good enough pronunciation? That's very good, yeah. Yeah, not bad. Uh, from the User Story. That's it. Who's based here in Norwich and we're uh, going to talk over the next half an hour or so on the user experience. So if, is that what people are going to get out of this, Tom, hopefully an explanation of what it is? Yeah, I think so. A little bit about what user experience is and um, what it's used for, really, what the value is and, and okay. why it might be something to consider. And for non-techies? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, yeah, a lot of what the work we do is about translating technology to make it easy for people to understand. So hopefully I can do a little bit of that today. <laughs> OK, so we'll do that. And we're in the St George's Works, which is an old shoe factory, I think, isn't it, in Colgate it in Norwich? That's it, yeah. yeah. And uh, I've, I've only recently found this building, but it's a great place to work, isn't it? It really is. There's so many businesses here, little businesses that are starting up or, you know, that are a little bit more established and we have digital agencies and companies like ours and solicitors and all sorts of different things and it's yeah it's a really nice environment actually to grow a, a yeah. business in I think. It's quite an eclectic mix isn't it as you say with lawyers as well as IT and techie stuff. That's it and I think it's one thing you don't tend to find in other places actually mm. when we you know do lots of work in some of these um, these hubs and things in London yep. and you find that it's all tech companies and they all yep. do similar things but actually it's quite nice to have a mix of different yes. people to talk to and you know, small businesses like ours need lawyers. We need accountants. Yeah, absolutely. It's quite handy to have one on the doorstep that you can kind of <laughs> ask a quick question to. So, yeah, it's lovely actually being here. Yeah, no, that's great. So let's kick off then, Tom, in terms of... And I'm not a techie in any way, shape or form. I'm of an age when, you know, it's all passed me by to a degree. I do things in a certain routine, and the moment I deviate from that routine, I'm normally lost. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So from a non-techie viewpoint, what, what is the user experience then? So the user experience in a nutshell is anything that a person experiences when they're interacting with a product or service. Okay. So that's, that's kind of the, uh, the dictionary definition, if you like. And there's kind of two explanations of this. Yeah. The first one is that, that, you know, that is what you call it. So when, when someone is actually experiencing something, it is the user experience. Um, but as, a, as an industry term, user experience is actually about how you build a good product. Um, so we kind of use it for digital products, so things like websites and apps and games and things like that. Um, and generally it's about a sort of um, a really good way of building a product that you know is going to work for your business and that is going to work for your users. Something that is, you know, technically sound, um, but actually kind of does the right thing and that people understand and just can, you know, pick up and use. So that's kind of the ideal, yeah. you know, what user experience is. And have the, has it always been around then? Because it sounds entirely logical the way you say it, and yet I get the impression that actually, to a large extent this is a relatively new sector. It is as a term. So user experience okay. as, a, as an industry is quite new. Um, and, you know, there are some companies that have been doing this for a very long time, but it's, it's, the definition has changed somewhat over the years. I think it's a, it's a sort of combination between product design and human-computer interaction, which is what okay. we used to call it back in the day. Um, uh, but it is, it is sort of a bit wider than that now, I think. Mm. We, we take in things like project management and databasing and data and, and lots of technical subjects, as well as good product design and visual design and copywriting and all these different things to become this big bubble of, of user experience. Mm. Um, so yeah, it has been around for quite some time, but okay. I think it's been known by lots of different things. And I guess it's changed somewhat, as you touched on there, because of the digital age. So I guess in the old days, it would have been more in you know how you interacted with a product or a, a, a visual brand or something of that nature. Would is that yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, product design. I suppose back in the day was absolute it was physical products. Yeah. And um, user experience at the time where I suppose it was coined. Um, you know, the the world didn't exist as it does now. You know, we we interact with digital products and services, and and you know, with the advent of Internet of Things, actually we are we are interacting with digital things, even if we don't really realise it yeah. these days. Whereas when we started looking at compute, human computer interaction, um, you know, with you know people like Grace Hopper, for example, started looking at how we actually make code make more sense for humans. And, you know, she was told, well, you can't do that. 
computers only understand computer language, they only understand maths. And of okay. course she said, well, mm, we, you know, actually we need to get people who understand business to work with computers better. And so she wrote the first compilers, which kind of gave us, um, you know, it's, it's the way that you help computers to understand human language, English. Okay. Um, so, it, you know, that's kind of the advent of user experience is how we interact with computers e in an easier way. Back then, we're talking about massive, great computers that filled a room. How long ago was this? Then? And this is, you know, this is back in the 60s and, and okay, 70s. Okay, so, so quite this a, long is a very time long time ago. Absolutely. And, it, you know, so we've kind of been working in that way for a very long time. Yeah. People have understood that it's about the way that we interact with machines easier. Um, nowadays, though, it's actually, it, all that stuff is much easier. We, you know, the barriers of technology are much, much lower. Mm -hmm. And getting into and building products is easier. So actually, it's about refining those experiences to make them more human yep. and to sort of match the real world a bit more. Yep. And that's where you see things like, um, uh, you know, your Alexas and, and Ceres, yep. um, where actually it's just a much more natural interaction. Yes. That's kind of what we see as user experience now. It's not really those how we actually talk to computers in code. It's about how we make them feel human and how we interact with things more naturally. And actually, that works very well with Alexa, doesn't it? I've got one in terms of, I think it's an Alexa, which is the Amazon Fire Stick. And you can talk to that and it doesn't get much wrong, does it? It doesn't. I think that one of the things that they're struggling with at the moment with, with some of these things, because it is a, still a relatively new technology, is that it can understand and interpret words, Yeah. but it's still struggling with intent. It's sort of is it? still trying to work out what you really mean by the words you say okay. is much harder than recognizing the words themselves. Yep. So you'll notice that things like Alexa, if you, if you have one, you probably get an email every week from Amazon saying, here's what you can do with Alexa. And it's sort of reminding you of all the things that Alexa understands because they're trying to train you how to use Alexa. So it's, <laughs> oh, I see. it's, it's, it's quite clever, isn't it? It's sort of, well, yes, it is. But then you think about it, it's also because Alexa doesn't really do all the things you need it to do yet. True. They're, they're marketing it as something that completely understands humans. Yes. But actually, it doesn't really yet. We yeah. still have to tell you what it can do. Yeah. And I think this is, this is the interesting thing we've got in the UX yeah. landscape at the moment is... You know, we've got technology that's really starting to catch up, but isn't quite there yet. Yeah. And how we help people to actually interact with these things can be quite tricky. Yes. So there must be some big risks with companies being at the cutting edge here, because you're, you're laying the groundwork inevitably for those who come after you and taking all the risk. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that user experience as a practice and mm. as an industry does is helps you to de-risk those projects. Okay. So user experience, the way that we practice it, is very iterative. So you try and get to market as quickly as you can with yep. something that just does something yep. so that you can learn as quickly as you can. Yep. And the idea being that actually you're not spending 18 months in a big product development cycle yep. where you're not really learning anything. You're um, able to test things very rapidly and change direction very rapidly and so and again because the barriers are so low we can build things in technology very very quickly um it means that you know things like alexa actually anybody can build these sorts of interfaces really? now yeah, yeah because it is it is so you know low barrier to entry yeah it's actually about testing those little interactions rather than building these big technological platforms because they already exist it's, that's yes. not the interesting part anymore yeah it's actually about how we interact with them yeah. There was a very interesting article in the Harvard Business Review a few months ago, maybe a year ago now, talking about the, the price of technology and, of course, how low it is. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they'd gone to the market and said, if we needed to rebuild Facebook from the ground up, mm -hmm. what's it going to cost? And, of course, you, you, people think of the millions, and actually it's in, it's in five figures. Yeah. It's, you know, the lowest figure was about $50,000 that actually the technology is all there. Absolutely, yeah, and I, I guess Facebook's value isn't really in there. Absolutely, anymore, so it isn't, isn't about the technology anymore, is it? It's about the user experience and, and everything else, good and bad. That's it, uh, yeah. And, and, and really, and well, I mean, Facebook's value now is in the fact that they've got, you know, one and a half billion users, I yes. imagine. But yeah, I, I see what you mean, yeah. actually. The, like you say, that barrier is now so low. Anybody can build these things. I mean, there, there are free platforms that you can pick up that will set up a social network in minutes. Really? You, know, you, you can you can do that. You can find yeah. an off the shelf platform to do that sort of thing, and that's the the interesting thing about where we are now mm. is that when 
the barrier is that low and anyone can do it, what is your differentiator? Yes. How do you build something that is quite It isn't unique? the tech, is it? It's not the tech. It's in the way that you approach your product yes. design and it's in the way that you interact with users. It's the way that you make it easy for them to use, that they understand what they're doing, they understand what's possible within your, within your framework mm -hmm. um, and that you're providing the right experience for them. And yet, if I play devil's advocate, I don't know the figure, you will, Tom, or we'll have a, we'll have a guesstimate to it. How many people are using UX when they're building uh, a website, for instance, or a product or a service? It's, it's in the minority, isn't it? It is. Yeah. And why is that? Because it seems perfectly logical to say, I've got this idea, this is what it looks like. It's, it's hard to know the exact answer to that because mm. I think there's lots of factors in, mm. in play here. I think it is still in the minority in that um, it, it seems to be reserved for some of those larger businesses. Yes. Because um, you're the, working, you've worked with some very big businesses, you know, on your website, people like Barber and you know, yeah, they're much bigger than some of these. That's companies. it, yeah. So, yeah, we've worked with, yeah, the likes of Barber and Virgin Wines yeah. and, you know, companies like that who, who either have their own teams that, that, do user experience or at least they outsource some of that work yeah um you know they have the budgets that are able that they're able to do that i think ux as well um uh you know the people in ux and the agencies that are around and the people that understand how to build good products online um are still few and far between so there aren't many of those okay. around and so it means that um you know if you if you work with a ux agency it probably comes at a little bit more of a premium than it would do if you yep. were working with you know a, a typical I say that in inverted commas, design or, or yep. web agency. Um, so I think that's probably one reason. But I, I do wonder if it's actually um, the tradition of, of building a new website, for example, um, is that you create a, a tender that you want people to, yep. to apply for. And you say, these are all the things that we want. Yeah. So not the problems we want to solve. These are the things these, we, want. Yeah, we want. These are the features that we want. Absolutely. We want a website that has 18 pages and we need these things on the pages and we want a blog and we want these things. And you give it out and of course people then apply for it and they might show you a few examples of what they're going to build for you. And you say, thanks very much. We'll have you. And because you've given us a nice price probably, and then they build it for you. But at no point during that process, does anyone actually go, are we building the right thing? Mm. Are we solving the right problems? Um, and how are we validating that we're doing those mm. things and those are actually the because again the barriers are low mm. and design relatively speaking is is cheaper and um, those are the things that cost the money so mm. i do wonder actually if it's because mm. there's this perception that ux is expensive and actually yeah um you know and also it's challenging isn't it because if i'm if i'm a website developer you know, I'm putting another barrier in the way, really, because I can build an 18-page website with a blog and this, mm -hmm. that, and the other, and the other features, you know, either code it or WordPress or whatever. And it, it's adding another barrier almost to say, actually, before you do this, if you really thought what you're trying to achieve and, and will you achieve it with the best website in the world? That's it, yeah. And I think a, a little bit of this is that old adage of um, going f slow to go fast. Mm -hmm. And, yes, you know, often making good decisions does take a little bit longer than just mm. doing what you think is right and following your biases. And yes, sometimes you will be right. And sometimes you will come up with an idea and you'll put it straight out there and it will hit the mark, but you definitely increase your chances of hitting yep. the mark by doing your, your research first. Yes. Um, but it's, you know, the way that we would work is we, like I say, we try and push something out as quickly as we can. And it's that iterative cycle. You're learning as quickly as you can, but you're also delivering stuff as quickly as you can. Yeah. So it means that, you know, you're at least moving forward. You're not actually standing still while you're doing your research. You're moving forward. Might be, albeit, at a slightly slower pace, but yeah, you're likely... You're still moving. You're, yeah, and you're making better decisions as you do it. So what sort of reactions do clients have then? So you, you, you know, so I, I engage with you and say, look, this, this is my concept. and. I'm pretty passionate about it and inevitably and you know I'm going to put my life on the line for this and then you come along and say actually it doesn't quite work is that, is, I mean I, I'm being very simplistic you don't say that you'll say there's a better way of doing it yeah but it, I mean is it a, managing the clients reactions quite tricky um it has been in the past well I can imagine it would be. <laughs> yeah I mean yeah we we do occasionally have a you know obviously we do lots of usability studies so that means we, you know, we bring in uh, your target market into our lab, 
and we ask them to complete tasks. It might be on your website or your app, you know, so, you know, for example, if you're running a retail site, we'd say, you know, you, you want to buy some new shoes for a party next week, off you go, go and do it. And we'll observe as we do it. We collect that behavioral information. So it's, it's quite scientific. And so we try and remove a little bit of that emotion from that process. It's much more about, can they follow the process? Do they understand what's actually available on the website? Do they, uh, are they able to understand how to fill in their address, fill in their card details, all that sort of stuff. So it's, it becomes quite um, mechanical and, okay. and we try and remove that emotion so that when the, the client is in a room across the building watching this happening live on a, on a screen, um, it sort of helps them to come to terms with this. It's not okay. about... You so know, it's not your judgment call. Exactly. And it's not, it. it's no. not even the, the sort of, the, you know, things like colours and, and your branding and all that sort of thing mm. don't necessarily matter in a usability session. It's actually about how people complete tasks. Yep. And if you, if, you, if you phrase it in the right, right yeah, way so and I you come against it the right way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, we're always a bit delicate when we deliver our sort of final report when we sure. do our usability studies because it is a nice long list of things that you've gotten wrong in your interface. Almost. <laughs> and it's, so it is a little bit of an awkward conversation. Yeah. Um, but I actually think that we find it more awkward than the client does because really we're helping they them want to solve to the problems. Absolutely. They want to know this yeah. stuff. You know, if they've come to us because they, they want to know if their website's going to do well when they launch yeah. it or, or whatever, or what the problems are, because they already have problems and they're trying to work out why are people dropping off on this page. They want to hear what we have to say. Yes. And so, yeah, I think we definitely find it more awkward than they do. And is, does that bring you to conflict with the web developers? Um, not, not usually, no. no. We, we tend to work with work developers and designers within businesses as much as we can. So okay. if there's already a team in place... We bring them in really early, particularly if it's a new project, yeah. um, because they're the ones that are going to be building it. Yeah. But I think what's really interesting about working with developers is that often um, th there's this um, stereotype that developers have their headphones in, they sit in a hoodie in a darkened room mm. in front of a, a computer all day, and that's absolutely true. Mm. <laughs> um, not for everyone, no. but it, you know, the stereotype is relatively true. Um, but the the interesting implication of that is that they don't often see the person that they're building the thing for. It oh, disconnects yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. Completely disconnects them from the product. Yeah. Because they're building code. They're not yep, delivering yep. value. And that's the thing they're actually doing. They're not mm. building code. They're not writing mm. code. They are delivering value mm. to a person, to the business, to the users. Um, and what we try and do is we try and connect them closer mm. to their customers. So Makes perfect sense. Absolutely. So whenever we do usability studies, we invite, obviously, the, the stakeholders from the client to come and observe the research, but we also invite the developers. We invite the testers. We invite the people who are doing the work because it's probably the only time they actually see their yeah. customers using the thing that they've built. How amazing. Never thought of it like that, but it's yeah, absolutely true. When it? else are they going to see those yeah. people using their product? So you're... And you're work involves physically inviting people in because there is a, there is an element of I, i've heard of user user experience being about you know where people look on the screen and where the mouse goes and stuff like that but yours is is more about the physical reactions to people sitting in front of a tablet or a mobile or a pc and how they navigate and what they do and the journey they take it can be yeah. so we have a lab here which is yeah, where we ask people in and we, we're observing their yeah. behaviours. Um, and it, it can be about physical reaction. Um, you also pick up things that you wouldn't pick up from, you know, things like Google Analytics. When you put those on websites, what you're getting is the what. You're seeing what is happening. Um, and you're seeing what pages people look at and what they're clicking. But what you're not really seeing is the why. Why are they doing those things? Or why are they not noticing something you want them to see? And so actually having someone in a room and observing those behaviours and then being able to infer or um, ask them to explain I was going to say, do you question them as to say... Absolutely, yeah. And um, much of uh, our job that, that we find really hard is actually uh, you know, asking those questions that aren't leading. Aren't yeah, it's trying to be as open as possible, isn't mm, it? Yeah, so that, that's probably the hardest part of a I'm user sure. experience researcher's training. Um, but but yeah. that's why you've got a psychologist in the team and... That's it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, she's come from a background which is about empirical evidence. Yeah. And, and everything we do is evidence-based design, yeah. essentially. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's quite nice to see that context 
of mm-hmm. actually why are they doing certain things and, and why have they clicked or not clicked certain elements. Um, but it's not just the only research we do, actually. We, we do um, remote research where we ask people to you know, open up their computer and we'll connect to it remotely and, mm-hmm. we, and they talk us through it. Um, we go out to people's homes on occasion or mm-hmm. their places of business and we watch as they're using... You know, of, often we've, we've done some research with um, mechanics, for example, using... Uh, software that they would use in the garage and there's no point in bringing them here because they haven't got a car in front of them so we go out to them and you know we've been known on occasions to just leave a camera in the garage for two weeks and watch them as they're working on vehicles while they're also using software so it's you know the the way that we'd approach research is very different depending on the kind of information we want um but yes i think the key part for us is about context it's about understanding why they're making certain decisions Mm. and not just what decisions that they're making Mm. And in terms of how well it works, have you got any examples at the front of your mind that says, you know, a client like me comes along and says, this is what I want, and but I'm not entirely sure I'm on the right track. Mm. And you're able to actually point me in a totally different direction and say, actually, what you've got there isn't going to work, but this would. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've we've worked with the two kind of key projects that we, we work with really are either new development so things where someone's got an idea for an application or or something they want to to do um and we help them to research it structure it in the right way deliver a really good spec document to developers so that they know what they're building and all that sort of thing and very early on you you uncover the real problems they're trying to solve yeah rather than just the thing that they want to build so i think um we've definitely worked with some clients particularly startups where they've sort of tweaked their product at the early stage mm-hmm. to really hit the market well. But the other thing we do is we work with companies that have something already. So they have a, a site or, or something where they're having specific problems. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, some of those projects are very interesting because they, they have this innate bias of how people use their product or they they kind of think that you know all of their customers, I don't know, are 40-year-old balding white men. Yeah. And of course, it's this perception that we're trying to challenge. And so... Um, yeah, it's very interesting actually when you see people surprised for the first yes. time about what they're seeing, um, and yeah, it is about challenging some of those those mm. stereotypes and perceptions they've got. I think, yeah. And I suppose we've got more chance to more opportunity now, haven't we, to challenge and to to, to really know. Whereas most of the time, when you, I mean, if you think of retail, most people haven't got a clue, have they, who, who the actual punter is in terms of demographic or. Mm-hmm. I mean, they have a bit of knowledge in terms of time of day they buy or whatever, but they don't know whether they've seen it online five times or been to three different shops. Or Actually, there's, there's, they know very little, really, do they? That's it, yeah. And so I think digital platforms make that easier to understand yes. some of those basic demographic information. So if you if you use something like Google Analytics, chances are you've got a rough idea of the kinds of genders and ages yeah. and maybe even occupations and things. Mm. But, uh, you know, one of the the things that we do for um, some of our clients is to understand a little bit more about what makes their users really tick. Mm. And so we do some research called ethnographic research. Never heard of it. Which is where, so we, we, um, again, we interview lots of users. um, But actually it's about finding out what they do during the day. So if, if for example, we're researching a retail um, website, we'll go and speak to some of the target market, but we want to find out you know what other products do they look at in the market yep. why are they searching for certain things we want to know what they do during the day you know how many children do they have and, and what challenges does that bring while they're looking at these sites and you know it's it's much more about the flavor and the context of yes, that person yes because i think that's the thing that we forget is when when we're looking at google analytics it's numbers and lines yes and it's it's not people yeah and we are designing for people when we design products yeah they're real people just like you and i and you know, actually bringing a bit of that colour and that flavour to those people um, is quite useful when you design yeah, products. So. And so, actually, one of the a really useful thing we do is is design personas. And so, uh, you know, a persona. I think a lot of the time, and you know, I'm I'm sure a lot of people will know what those are and they'll have seen those before. Um, but often they're sort of made up. So, yes. So you know. Uh, you know, people will just go, oh, I think our customer is 30 years old, they're this and they're yeah. that, and they're, they're pretty good at using computers and everything else. But actually, they don't really talk to those people to find out that that's true. So we go out and we research and we validate those personas to make sure that they are genuinely true. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but we also just uncover, you know, new pain points and new motivations that yep. make these people make these people do what they do. Um, but I think one of the key things you can do is when when you've got those personas is print them, yeah. stick them up on a wall in your yes. in your office, and you know you are there now. You know you've got them front of mind yep. whenever you're doing something in your business, whether it's does it does it relate to that now absolutely. personally? Yeah, if you're designing a product, if you're if you're a developer, a designer, or even if you're a you know project manager, or in, you're in human resources, you've got these these yes. people that you you they're front of mind and they are the people that you're doing your work for. So it's it's about the context, it's about the flavour. Yeah. So you, rather bizarrely, because you're you're technically very strong, but actually you're it's all a lot about a human emotion, isn't it? So the, the, hence the psychologist and, and the psychology angle. Mm. As a, it, you wouldn't normally put those two together, would you? No. no so you you're wouldn't. unusual in that sense, aren't you? Yeah, we're fairly unique, particularly mm. in the area. I think we're quite mm. unique. Um, yeah. So our, yeah, our team is made up of you know uh, me, and I'm an ex developer, so I'm fairly technical. Um, but I've come from that user experience background with a bit of a, a sort of a munging of everything, really. <laughs> um, but we've we've got designers and yeah, a psychologist yeah. on our team as well, and it and it is a bit of an odd mix, but it does work very well. They're very yeah. complementary skills. Um, yeah, because it is about behaviours and it's yes. about bringing some of that evidence really to your yeah. design um, which is something that I think gets missed a lot in design mm. is that human behaviour element mm. um, design is quite subjective I think yes. it's, it's one of those things that um, uh, you know you often hear that phrase well I'll, I'll know it when I see it and that tends to be the, the way in much of the way that websites are designed particularly for small businesses actually I, I just kind of know what I like and I, yes. I, that's what I want um, but yeah, the bit that you forget is actually people are going to use this. They're going to mm. get something mm. from your site very quickly. So mm. as soon as they see that, they're making snap mm. judgments mm. of what that means to them yep. and what they think they're going to find on that. Mm. And so actually having someone who understands how the brain works a little yep. bit is it's actually really useful. Pretty, pretty handy. <laughs> yeah. So where do you think, I know it's an impossible question, but have a stand, where, where do you think the UX will be in sort of five or ten years? I mean, only... You're at the forefront as a, the vanguard, as I see it. So, wh wh you know, what's your thoughts? In, what's it going to be? Um, I think as people understand more about what the process is of user experience, that kind of iterative process of product design and learning and, and implementing and measuring and, and relearning and everything else, um, I think the costs will start to decrease. And I think yeah. you'll see some of those smaller businesses start to pick it up. Um, I think there's some interesting challenges coming up for user experience. So I think that... Um, particularly things like voice you know we talked about Alexa earlier that's mm -hmm. a, a really interesting area of growth at the moment mm -hmm. for um, for user experience because it is hard to do it, there's mm -hmm. no visual interface it's something mm -hmm. that you know you're, you're relying on people remembering how things work mm -hmm. and that's a very tricky thing to do so yeah. I think there's going to be a lot of growth in that in that area um, yeah I, I wouldn't be surprised if it becomes a bit more commonplace over the next two years so okay so as short as that yeah absolutely because it is something that's just becoming saturated within, you know, what people are thinking about in digital yep. at the moment. It's a, you know, a very well heard term, but not particularly well understood, yep. I think. Yeah. And, um, you know, there are lots of firms that have been doing this for a very long time who are the the leaders who are sort of teaching others on, on what this is. And I think we're going to hear a lot about, um, you know, the benefits of user experience over the next couple of years. And that's where people will start to realise that it's really something they need to invest in. So I, I'd say, yeah, over, over the next five years, we'll see a lot more smaller businesses picking up people with these product design skills. I think the the key part to that, though, is the education process, which mm -hmm. is still catching up, mm -hmm. I think. You know, we've got the um, Norwich University Arts at the moment have mm -hmm. a user experience course and, okay. an, and an interaction course. And they are the uh, two of the first three uh, BSCs. Uh, which are you know Bachelor of Science yeah. that the arts uh, school is doing. They've right. never done that before, so it's they see this as a. So the UEA a, doesn't do any. The UEA doesn't do one though. Okay. So it's, it's they've got some modules I think as part of their computer science courses, but nothing on the scale of, of the a, course. That in some ways, sounds a bit odd, doesn't it? So University of the Arts, whereas yeah. actually this is this has a direct technical application that's it, it. yeah that's it really does and which is why it makes sense for them to do it as a bsc rather than a BA. yes yes but the the way that they're approaching it which i think is really clever is there it's a creative science 
Okay. Which yeah. is really nice because yes. that is exactly what yes, user it experience is. is. It's about applying a scientific constraint and, yeah. and behavioral analysis and all this stuff to creativity and, yes. and design. Um, and actually what we're finding is people that kind of, you know, I can't draw for toffee. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I still consider myself to be fairly creative. I like to build stuff. Yeah. Um, but I'm also quite technical. It's the perfect merging yeah, of those just, two worlds. Yeah. yeah. And we find that lots of people cross over those two worlds of science and design. And this is the perfect place for them yes. um, to learn and, and to grow. And so we're, we're starting to see universities picking that up. And I think, um, yeah, it'll be really interesting when we start seeing the first set of graduates out of the yeah. user experience courses go into the workplace in the next few years. And that's where we'll start to see product design really picking up. It's good to see Norwich at the forefront of there as well, doesn't it? Absolutely. I mean, we've we've got one of the biggest uh, user, user user experience agencies uh, in the world based here. Really, it's foolproof. Yeah. yeah, who are you know um, very well known in the industry, and they are real thought leaders. Um, yeah, and it is quite nice actually to have one or two mm. companies like us now starting to pick up. We're one of the first in the in the region at our size, and uh, with the companies we work with, you know, we are one of the first. Um, but it's it's quite nice to see some of those companies now picking up user experience skills into their agencies, yes. um, particularly some of the full service agencies. Yep. They're now looking for this as a, as a skill they want to grow in. Um, yeah, and, you know, Norwich, we, we've got a very good tech scene, actually. Mm. And so I'm not surprised that mm. we're now, this is our next area mm. of growth, I think. Yeah. And in terms of people wanting to get in contact with you, Tom. Who, who do you want to... Do you want to talk to people, you know, the service providers? Do you want to talk to the web developers? The people who've got a business idea already? I mean, who, who's your target market? So I think if it's if it's a new idea, yep. then yes, a business owner or, or perhaps someone who, who's looking... who's got that entrepreneurial spark who wants yep. to push ahead with a, with a new product idea. I think, yeah, anybody with that mm-hmm. sort of sort of idea really um you know we can help to define what the product looks like before any code is is written yeah um and we can even test things before any code is written yeah which is which save is you money cool. absolutely um and de-risk those yep. future parts of the project so that that's quite good i think anybody that's in a, a business already um the way we tend to work is with the product owners or um it might be the leaders of that business but it's actually often the stakeholders in the middle so it's the people that are actually working on developments to the project and new features and yep. things like that um so that's the sort of business that we we look for yeah and web developers do you work with them we do um but it tends to be through through via somebody yeah else. yeah i mean we, why is so, that though because it sounds like a perfect mix otherwise well we do tend to work with some agencies right so okay. actually we we have uh, quite a few agency partnerships in norwich where you know they they perhaps need the research element because that's the part they're missing. Yeah. Um, so we fill in that gap. I think we, we do on occasion work with an individual web developer, but it tends to be that they're working with mm-hmm. um, a much smaller company. Yeah. Um, and I think they, they just wouldn't have the funds to be able to work with a company yep. like ours at the moment. Um, so, yeah, I th- but I think, again, that will change in the future. Yes. Um, Particularly because the cost of web development. I mean, you can build a website now for yeah. a couple of quid a month, yeah. couldn't you? And you can yeah. do it yourself. Yeah. So actually, that stuff is the easy bit. Yeah. It's the learning and the research yes. that's the hard bit. So I think we're starting to find that people are, are yeah. switching the way that they're they're actually, you know, what, what they're paying for in their design. Yes, as they understand where the value really is, I guess. That's it. it. Yeah, Which is what it's it. about. Yeah. Now, on most websites, it talks about anti-slavery and things like that. And have you got an anti-slavery statement on your website? Uh, we don't. No, no. I've never quite understood it really. Uh, but, no, but, but we, you've got a bribery one. On we your do website. have a. We do have a. Well, pro, you're saying you're actually you're open. Oh, we're bribery. pro bribery. Very pro bribery. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> and I loved what it was. And you told me it changes because I, when That's I looked, it, it was Adnams, yes. which is beer, yeah, uh, and, or, or coffee, but not. And you, you're not even being, you know. A cheapskate. I'm a tart for coffee, but you're yeah. saying you want a bag of coffee. Oh yeah, and it's bribing us. We're not going to bribe anyone else. We <laughs> want to be bribed. But, <laughs> yeah. So on the on our footer, we we kind of list out the companies, and we're always adding to it as well. But it's all the local companies that we love. Yeah, so, well, like Strangers Coffee, Strangers yeah. Coffee, yeah, Nor Adams, Chocolate, and of course, Adams, Nor yeah, Chocolate. Yeah. yeah, and we you know we love you know board games from Langley's. And, oh, you know, that's all right. It's all the board games. So yeah, and it's yeah, it's just it's quite nice to have a little hat tip to local. companies 
companies that we, you know, because we're always, in, you know, we, we love local companies. We love working with local companies. And um, I think it's really important to support your, your yes. local area too. Um, and actually, yeah. it's a really good way of doing it, isn't it? Because it makes you smile when you read it. It just And you remember it like I did. You yeah. Said, I think actually, that's different and yeah. quite nice. Yeah, that's right. It's just kind of a quiet little nudge as well. But, yeah, no, I think that's very know. good. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we might be able to lower our prices if you buy us a cake from Fig Bar. <laughs> totally cool with that. That's yeah, absolutely, it's yeah. not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so how do people get in touch with you then, Tom, if they want to say, actually, this is interesting and you're open to a bribe. Uh, how do they get in touch with you? So, uh, well, yeah, all cake can be sent to St. George's Works in Norwich. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're based at, at St. George's Works. Um, we, obviously, are from our website, the user Which story, is, it's the userstory.com. Yep. Um, and, and by email as well, so hello at the user yep. story .com. We're, uh, we're always on Twitter and LinkedIn and everything else okay. as well, so you can search for the user story and you'll find us. Um, you're open to contact, even if it's a you know a germ of an idea that somebody's got, rather than I'm absolutely. ready to I'm ready to go straight away. Yeah, absolutely. We we've worked with you know big multinational companies and yep. and um, you know companies with lots and lots of budget and UX budgets and all that sort of thing. But we also do a lot of work with startups. Yeah. Um. So those that perhaps have you know got their first bit of funding and they're looking for a bit of yep. you know product design help. But I'm more than happy to just give people a little bit of a nudge in the right direction if they yep. need some if they need some early advice. Yeah, you know, uh, we want to get people to the point where their products have that first step, so yep. that we can really give you some some support. Yep. So if we can just give you a little bit of advice to get you there, I'm more than happy to do that. Oh, that's brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Tom. It's been a good 36 minutes. Thank you. Uh, and it's flown by. So I have certainly uh, learned a great deal, and I would urge people to get in touch with Tom. He's a he's a good fellow. And he also likes dogs, so he can't be all bad. <laughs> uh, and thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.